This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You'll hear a telephone conversation. Now you have some time to look at questions one to six. Listen to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Good morning, Country Comfort Albury. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. I'd like to find a double room to stay for the weekend. What kind of rooms do you have? Well, we provide a variety range of accommodation depending upon your likes. The guest house room costs $45 per night. It provides air conditioning and shower. And a waterfront room costs $80 per night. It has got its own balcony overlooking the foreshore of the lake. And uh, we've got a kid. How do you charge for children? Extra bedding is available if you require that. If the kid is aged 12 and below, the cost is $10 per night for the guest house room and $15 for the waterfront room. Do you have a swimming pool, tennis court or something like that? Yes, we've got a swimming pool, which is free for all the guests. But the tennis court charges $8 each hour, including the rent of rackets. How about other facilities? We provide free off-street car parking and internet access. We also installed in-house movies, but that costs $4 per hour. Oh, we don't think we need that. Because of the kid, you know. We don't want him to see movies on the weekend. Well, we also offer ironing equipment in the room. That's useful, I think. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through the questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the last part of the conversation and answer questions 7 to 10. Great! Could you tell me the address? How do we get there? Yes, it's Country Comfort Albury, A-L-B-U-R-Y, at 648 Dean Street, New South Wales. 648 Dean Street, D-E-A-N, is that right? Yes. Well, I wonder what activities are available there in this season. You know, we want to have an indulgent weekend in the boring winter. Oh, you'll not get bored here. You know, Albury is the perfect base for alpine skiing. Besides that, winter's frosty alpine air encourages walks through mist-laden valleys. You can walk alongside rushing streams and waterfalls. After returning to the warm and comfortable lounge, you can sit by the open fire. I think this is the ideal time of year to nourish your body at the Salus Spa. The idea of skiing doesn't appeal to me very much, but it sounds good to have a relaxing walk through the valleys. Maybe after that, I'll have a massage and some soaking in the spa. And you know, this hotel is perfectly located in a quiet position off the main highway in central Albury. It's within walking distance of licensed clubs, restaurants, shops, and the central business district. It's known for its excellent cuisine and warm Australian hospitality. Good. It's a good idea to taste the tasty dishes in one of the restaurants. My wife may be interested in shopping. She's always keen on that. I think I'll contact you later. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to a group of tourists who are visiting a historic town on the east coast of the USA. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17 on page 129. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Right. So here we are in Fairhaven, and we have a couple of hours to spend in this historic center before we carry on to our motel. And as you'll know from the itinerary of our trip, we're visiting Fairhaven because of its historical links with a man called Manjiro Nakahama. So I'll begin by giving you a brief overview of his life, and then you can explore the town at your leisure. Well, Manjiro Nakahama, as he was then known, was born in 1827 in a village by the sea in what is now Toshishimazu in Japan. And like many people in that town, he became a fisherman when he was just a youngster. One day in 1841, when he was just 14 years old, he and some others were fishing far off the coast of Japan when they were caught in a storm and shipwrecked on a small deserted island. They had to wait for six months before they were rescued by an American whale ship that had stopped at the island by chance. Four of the five Japanese were put ashore in Hawaii, but Manjiro had become friends with a captain, William Whitfield, who came from the town of Fairhaven, where we are now and he chose to remain aboard and to return with the boat to the USA. So Manjiro unwittingly became the first Japanese ever to set foot on American soil. He came back right here to Fairhaven with Whitfield and stayed with the Whitfield family, who paid for his education here in the town. He studied mathematics and geography, as well as shipbuilding and navigation. But he missed his mother and his own country and eventually he went back to Japan, where he had a responsible position as a university teacher and also served an invaluable role as interpreter during the initiation of relations between Japan and the United States in the middle of the 19th century. But the most interesting thing is that the links between Toshishimizu and Fairhaven have remained and grown stronger over the years, in spite of the distance between them. And in fact, the two places now have the official status of sister cities. Both places are ports, so in fact the inhabitants have a lot in common. There have been a number of visits by the inhabitants of Toshishimizu, in particular at the time of the festival, which is held every two years here in Fairhaven to celebrate the life and achievements of John Manjiro. It takes place in the fall, and there's an ever-growing program including drumming, singing, martial arts, and stalls selling Japanese and American food. So if you're going to be in the region around then, it's really worth a visit. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20 on page 129. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20.
Now, many of the buildings that Manjiro Nakahama knew in Fairhaven are still standing today. And so if you'd just like to hand round some copies of this map, I'll suggest the best route to follow to see them. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of the map, you can see the Millicent Library. And that's where we are now. Now, to follow the John Manjiro Trail, you go out of here along Center Street and then head up Main Street until you get to Pilgrim Avenue. Go down there and turn right at the end. Go straight on, and just on the corner with Oxford Street, you'll see a two-story house. This is the Whitfield family house, and this is where Manjiro first stayed when he came to Fairhaven. It's still a private residence, so please respect the owner's privacy. Okay, now if you carry on along Oxford Street, then turn left at the end, you'll come to North Street. And about halfway down there is what's known as Old Oxford School. This was the very same school that Manjiro attended when he lived here. It was considered to be the best school in town because of the quality of the building. Unusually, it was built of stone. And the quality of the teaching. Nowadays, it's usually closed, except on special occasions. Go on to the end of North Street and turn the corner onto Adams Street. If you follow the road down back towards the library, you go round a couple of sharp bends, and on the second of these, you can see the School of Navigation, which Manjiro also attended. And if you follow the road on, you'll soon find yourself back here at the library. And I'd suggest you spend some time looking round that too if you have any time left. Right. Now, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Mr. Jackson, who feels that he is physically unfit, is consulting with his doctor about his health condition. Before you listen to their conversation, you have a chance to read questions 21 to 24. Now please listen to the recording and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, Mr Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. Physically, that is. My, uh, my very thorough re-examination and the, the analyst's report show that basically you are very fit. Yes, very fit. So, why is it, Doctor that I'm always so nervy, tense, ready to jump on anybody, my wife, children, colleagues. I think, um, I think your condition has a lot to do with, um, shall we call it, way of life, habits? Way of life? Habits? Yes, now tell me, Mr. Jackson, you smoke, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I do, Doctor. And uh, rather heavily, I imagine. Well, yes. I smoke, what, about 40, 50 a day, I suppose. You should do your best to stop, you know. Yes, I see. But, uh, well, it won't be the first time. I've tried to give up smoking several times, but it's, it's no good. You see, 50 a day is overdoing it, you must admit. You must cut down at least that. Oh, yes. I know that when you're feeling tense, you, you, you probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you. But in the long run, I do advise you to make, to make a real effort to quit smoking. Of course. But, well, it's easy to say give it up or cut it down. But, oh, you know. 
Well, in my opinion, you have no choice. Either you make a real effort, or or there's no real chance of your feeling better. You see, well, obviously, I could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer, but would that help? I'd prefer, and I'm quite sure you'll agree, I'd prefer to see you really back to normal, not just seemingly so. And that's my reason for asking you several more questions about about your other habits. Right. Now you have a chance to read questions twenty-five to thirty. As you listen to more of their conversation. Answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Your eating habits, for example. What do you eat normally during a normal day? Yes, well, I'm a good eater. Yes, I'd say I'm a good eater. Now let's see. Up at eight in the morning, and my wife has a good breakfast ready. A good breakfast. The usual. A cereal followed by bacon and eggs with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two, then toast and marmalade, all washed down with a couple of cups of tea. I uh yes, I really enjoy my breakfast. Uh yes, I can see you do, but I'd advise you to eat rather less. We'll come to that later. Go on. Then lunch, no first brunch, a cup of coffee and a bun at eleven. Lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time. So I have a pint and a sandwich in the pub, all very hurried. Try to be in less of a hurry. But I make up for it in the evening. I get home at about seven. Dinners around about eight. Er,、uh, yes, my wife's an excellent cook. Excellent. It's usually some meat dish, and we like spaghetti as a first course. Spaghetti, a meat dish, cheese, sweet, but、uh, but then at the end of the day, shall we say, then well then I begin to feel on edge again. Most evenings after dinner we read or watch TV, but I I get this terrible feeling of tension. Well, I'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food, but、um, I really do recommend. That you, that you eat less, and secondly, that you eat more healthily. Instead of having that enormous breakfast, for example,、um, well, try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal. I see, but eleven、uh... says right. Well, that's all right, but lunch should be more leisurely. Remember, your health is at stake, not your job. As for dinner,、um, I'd advise you to eat a soup, perhaps with a salad, a salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb, granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No, that won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, doctor. But no. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You are going to hear a lecture on ecology. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. 
I'd like to turn it over to Dr Carey, who will talk about the program in restoration ecology. Thanks, Chris. A lot of people think that human beings can do whatever they want to the environment. But as Aldo Leopold taught, land is a system of interdependent parts which should be regarded as a community and not a commodity. Well, that idea has influenced what we teach here in our program, where students come from all over the world to learn about restoring native plant communities back into an ecologically natural state. This field is therefore a combination of formal science with practical applications, and that is quite attractive to many people. We have students, for example, from many different nations who come just to take part in this unique program. Our location is also quite unique. We have the world's oldest restored native plant community in Curtis Prairie at the Wisconsin Arboretum. Some say that this is proof that the science of restoration ecology was birthed in Wisconsin. Well, that may be oversimplified, but our reputation is strong. But students don't have to study prairies only. One student, Edmund Mukala, from the Congo, came to study restoring ancient wetlands in the Congo using knowledge gained from historic samples of the soil seed bank. Not all the seeds survived, but some can remain dormant for many years. Mr. Mukala wanted to find out what type of community would be most similar to that ancient seed bank. He has recently returned to the Congo and is now cooperating with the government to implement his findings. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the talk continues, answer questions 36 to 40. So the only prerequisite for doing research here is that it is a native plant community. That means not just prairies, but wetlands, woodlands, savannas, and other environments. We're proud of the diversity of research topics in our program. And we continue to grow. This year we have 32 new students from eight different countries. When students first arrive, they begin rigid coursework in statistics, ecology, plant identification, and the theory of landscape change. Then they take part in internships at local conservation agencies such as the Arboretum, the Nature Conservancy, the Parks Department, and others. We find internships to be crucial in helping students apply the knowledge they have gained in the classroom. And we're proud to say that, since the beginning, we have graduated 277 students with master degrees from our programs and 122 students with PhDs. Some have gone on to bigger and better things. One graduate is now the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in China. Another is the director of parks development in California. And others now lead their own research departments in universities around the world. That is the end of part four. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. <laughs>